Well, you did it. You made it through the entire Bible. Well, not yet, if we make it through this sermon. We will have studied all 66 books, a book at a time, on our Sunday nights together. This has been a delightful study. Uh, This has been uh, hard work for all those who have participated in this endeavor. And yet, what a great, wonderful overview for us of the entire Bible. We come now to the last book of our Bible. And I want to answer the question, what is next? When we get done with this book, it... I think what needs to happen next is Christ returns for his church, and so I'll see you all at home. And if he doesn't, if it's in his sovereign plan to redeem more sinners before bringing judgment to the world, then I'll see you next week, Lord willing. And next week, we will not meet Sunday night. Next week is our men's conference. There will be no evening service. And so the following week, we will begin a series in the Psalms. And we will do a psalm a night through Psalm 50. Then we'll take a break, do something else. Uh, But even in that series of the psalms, uh, we're planning to do four psalms and then something in between. And it will be appropriate for us to sing during this psalms series. So we'll be doing some Q&As and some singing on those weeks sort of in between psalms. So you can be ready for that. Uh, You can be pre-reading the psalms, if you like, in preparation for that. And we look forward to that series. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation re-ravels what the fall unraveled. There are four pages in your Bible where there is no brokenness, no sin, no darkness, no curse, where the universe is not bent and where every endeavor is not plagued by rust and weeds and corruptions. Only four pages in your Bible. The first two and the last two. Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. Those are the bookends on the whole story of redemption, and everything in between, in a sense, is the question, how do we get back into the garden? How does humanity get back into immediate fellowship with God? That immediate fellowship was broken by sin, and death entered the world through sin. And so all men sinned as a result of that spiritual death. Everything in the Bible between Genesis 3 and Revelation 20 is the story of redemption and the story of judgment. If the theme of the Bible is the glory of God as king, judging sin and saving sinners. Then we see the book of Revelation bringing all of the pieces back together. The book of Revelation undoes all the tensions. It resolves all mysteries. In fact, it brings all the threads of the Bible stories back together, weaves them into one final conclusion. Oh, how we need the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation gets its title from its first word. It is apocalypsis or the revealing. We hear the word apocalyptic and we think summer camp 24. I don't know what you think of. Movies that depict uh, catastrophe and devastation, deep, dark mysteries. There's a whole genre of literature called apocalyptic literature, which is deep and dark mysteries and symbols that cannot be plumbed. The word apocalypse simply means revelation, a revealing, not a concealing. The book of Revelation exists for God to reveal his mind, his heart, his plan. And he's given it to us so that we could know it. And not merely for intellectual curiosities, not so that you could pre-write the tabloids, Not so that you could make prognostications to impress your friends, but that you could know Him. His plans are revealed. The future is revealed. Human hearts are revealed by this book. And first and foremost, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is much debate about whether that means Jesus Christ is revealing something or Jesus Christ is being revealed by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I take this to mean Jesus Christ is being revealed. 
This is the self-disclosure of the maker of the universe, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King in all of his glory. This book comes with a blessing. You know this, verse 3. Blessed or happy is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. This is an encouragement at the beginning of the book to read and hear and heed the contents of this book. We need to know this book. The book of Revelation gives us its own outline. Look down at chapter 1, verse 19. John here is commanded to write. He's commanded to write. He sees visions about the past, present, and future from his standpoint, and then he is commanded by God to write them down for our benefit and distribute them to the churches. Verse 19 gives us the outline for the book. Jesus says to him, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. The things which you've seen detail chapter 1, that's the vision of Christ John gets. The things which are the present state of the churches in John's day, that's chapters 2 and 3. And everything after that is future, chapter 4 to the end. Jesus commands John, write the past, the present, and the future. I've given you an outline up on the screen for the book of Revelation. Um, you can write this down, take a picture of it. If you want me to send it to you, I'll just send it to you. But this is a really good handle, sort of a roadmap for the book of Revelation. It, chapter 1 gives us the vision of Christ, the exalted Messiah in, in all of his glory that John got to see. Chapters 2 and 3 give us the state of the churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, where John had pastored and was now exiled from. He was away from the people he cared for and preached to and pastored. And then he writes to them, or Jesus writes to them through John, through the angels, to each of the churches. Chapters 4 and 5 give us a throne room scene of heaven. We know that that's future from John's day because John leads that section with the temporal marker, after these things I saw. But there's some confusion about the time here because John in his own day was transported into a yet future scene in the throne room of heaven where the kingdom of God is being handed to the rightful owner, Jesus receives the title deed to the earth, breaks the seal, opens the scrolls, and initiates the tribulation. That hasn't happened yet. John got to see in the first century what would happen still future to us. That's chapters 4 and 5, the throne room scene. And then 6 through 18 deal with the tribulation. That seven-year period of time where Antichrist is operative on the earth, where the fullness of man's rebellion against God is unleashed and heaven is unleashed in judgment against the earth dwellers in successive series of judgments, seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl judgments that ramp up in their ferocity and accelerate in their velocity, culminating in chapter 19, the return of Christ to the earth. The book of Revelation is roughly chronological. I say roughly because chapter 1 happened in John's day. Chapters 2 and 3 happened in John's day. Chapters 4 and 5 are future, but John got to see it in his day. And then 6 through 18 detail the chronology of the tribulation period. There are a few flashbacks in there. Followed by the return of the king in chapter 19 leading to the millennial reign of Jesus the King on the earth in chapter 20, where he will sit on the throne of David for a thousand years, rule the nations with a rod of iron. Satan will be locked up. The world will belong to Christ. There will still be death. There will still be sin. There will still be need of discipline and correction. Justice meted out. But it will be the best phase of human history yet seen and it will bring to fulfillment many of the promises of the Old Testament and the New Testament related to Messiah's role on the earth. That is followed by that great white throne judgment in the second half of Revelation 20, where Jesus sits on the throne, and the books are opened, and the dead are judged according to their deeds, and anyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. Eternal conscious torment, what we call hell. 
And then you have this monumental break after chapter 20. We get to the last two pages of the Bible, the last two chapters, 21 and 22, which detail the eternal state. The eternal state called a new heavens and new earth. It is a new universe. The old universe flees from the very presence of the glorious Christ at the great, great white throne, and no place was found for it anymore. Peter talks about it being burned up at the level of the elements. And God brings in a new heavens and a new earth, and the new Jerusalem, which he has been preparing for his people, which has been in the throne room area of God. That is the third heaven, which doesn't get destroyed when the universe is destroyed. It transcends the universe. That new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, plants itself on the earth, and God and the Lamb are the temple and the light of that city on the new earth. That eternal state never ends And we discover there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness, no more death, no more curse, because the first things have passed. That's the outline of the book. It stretches from John's day to the eternal state in a rough chronology, and we find ourselves in between chapter 3 and chapter 4, in a sense. John got to witness chapter 4 and 5 before our day, but that scene hasn't happened yet. So if you want to locate where we are in this outline, we're between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Now that's, that's the outline. I, I want to turn away from organizing the book of Revelation and overviewing the book of Revelation. And, and I want to spend the remainder of our time this evening hearing and heeding some of the messages of the book of Revelation. You need to know something about the eschatology of your Bible or the study of end times in your Bible. It is not there to pique our curiosity. Primarily, God's revelation, his disclosure about future events is designed to provoke godly living. We would call this an ethical eschatology. The book of Revelation is no different. It is designed by God to provoke us And I want to allow the book of Revelation this evening to preach some sermons to us. So, six sermons from the book of Revelation following the outline we just looked at. Sermon number one comes from chapter one. And the point of this sermon is simply this, be in awe of Jesus. Be in awe of Jesus. Look at verse seven, chapter one. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Jesus says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, first and last letter of the alphabet, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And then in verse 9, John reveals he was on the island of Patmos. A little rock in the Aegean Sea is like the Alcatraz of the Roman Empire. He was in jail for his witness, his testimony, Christ. Verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. John got to see Christ uncloaked. Jesus in his exalted glory. The glory that he had with the Father before the world began. The glory that he longed for his disciples to see in him. And John's response was like Isaiah's response and Ezekiel's response. He he fell before the glorified Christ like a dead man. This was the same John who nestled close to Jesus around a dinner table at the Last Supper. He was familiar. He was friendly. He was a companion 
of Jesus on the earth. And here he sees Jesus in his glory and he falls down like a dead man. Jesus hasn't changed, but John gets to see more of him here. And he is floored. This scene is a scene we need about Christ. Was Jesus humble when he was on the earth? unrecognized, walking around incognito, taking on the form of man and the form of a slave, humble, gentle, yes. And he has not changed in his character or his nature. But here in chapter one, we get a new reverence for Christ as the glorious one is unmasked, uncloaked, unobscured, by humiliation. His tenderness is still here. Notice verse 17. Jesus placed his right hand on me, John records, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I possess the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write. Jesus reveals himself in his glory to John. What does that do to our hearts? To catch a glimpse of the one who looks at that bright orb, his face looks like that bright orb in the sky that you're not allowed to look at it so bright you'll go blind. Whose voice sounds like Niagara Falls, obscuring and thundering over every other sound, dominating all that is in his presence. To see Jesus this way provokes our hearts to awe, to worship, to reverence. We need to see Christ this way. We need this book. This is where all of heaven is going. God himself said that he would exalt the Son to the place of glory so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, every tongue would confess. I believe that includes all of Jesus' enemies. We learn in Philippians 3.21 that Jesus has the power to make all of his enemies submit to him. All will worship him. All will give glory to God's Christ, whether in judgment or in salvation. This vision of Christ provokes us to worship. And that's the sermon from chapter 1. Let's move on to a sermon from chapters 2 and 3. The book of Revelation is going to teach us how to live here by teaching us to evaluate our lives and our churches. Jesus is depicted as one who walks among the lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. Seven churches in Asia Minor in a circular postal route symbolized by seven lampstands and Jesus walking among them. He knows his churches. He's with his churches. He promised to be with them to the end of the age. He inspects his churches. He scrutinizes them. Jesus removes lampstands. That is, he takes churches out of their place if they are unfaithful. He is infinite in his wisdom and his knowledge, and he cares. These letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 are a wonderful template for us to evaluate local churches today. They're also really helpful templates for us to evaluate our own individual lives before the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows our hearts before we ever open these letters and read them. And he's given these with the instructions, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It is then individualized so that any church can apply these letters and any individual Christian ought to apply these letters. And the scrutiny of Jesus in these letters comes with commendations and confrontations. There are things that Jesus says, I know your deeds. Good job. Persevere. Take courage. And there are other segments where Jesus says, I know your deeds. Repent or else you don't get to be a church anymore. Let's think about these evaluations. It begins with the church at Ephesus. Ephesus is commended for many things. 
They sniffed out wolves, false teachers, false apostles. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Those were the guys who came in and said, you can have some Jesus and some immorality too. It's fine. It all goes together. Just live the way you want and you're safe. And the church at Ephesus hated those guys. And Jesus says, I hate those guys too. Good job. But Jesus addressed the church at Ephesus with this painful indictment. You have divorced yourself from your first love, the love you had at the beginning. You've left it, abandoned it, and you don't get to be a church anymore if you leave your first love. So repent and do the deeds you did at the beginning. Listen, there's a letter that applies to a church like Grace Bible Church with a sound doctrinal statement and, and a discernment about false teaching and a Bible reading populace who might be wary about threats internally and, and threats externally, who could lose sight of what it was like to be redeemed, who have forgotten what it is like to smell the, the smoke and the singed hairs on the arms as you walked out of the destruction you were bound for, and to forget to look up and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I remember what it was like to be lost and blind and a slave, and now I'm yours and I'm free. Thank you. We lose sight of that as a church. We don't get to be a church anymore. If love has left the building, it is an ontological failure, a failure at our very essence, at our being, at what we claim we are. It's a severe warning along with the commendations there. The second letter is a letter to Smyrna. We might label Smyrna as faithful under fire. Faithful under fire. Look what Jesus says to them. The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty, but you're really rich. I know the blasphemy by those who say they're Jews and they're not. They're a synagogue of Satan. Don't fear. Don't fear what you are about to suffer. There will be a period of time of suffering for you. Some will go to jail. Be faithful until death and I'll give you the crown of life. This from the one who was dead and is now alive. He can make good on this promise. You be faithful to Jesus under the fire of difficulty from the world. And Jesus promises life. It's an encouragement. No, no, com, no confrontation to Smyrna. Only commendation and encouragement. There's a lesson in that for us. Jesus knows Jesus knows where you are, Christian. He knows the truth of things. He knows your heart. He will be close to the brokenhearted. He will defend his own. He will keep his own. Take heart. There's a letter to Pergamum. Pergamum was comfortable with compromise. Jesus knew things about them. They were dwelling where Satan's throne was, a, a remark to a great big geological feature in town, a giant rock that looked like a throne. It was actually called Satan's throne in town, this geological feature. He's using those geographical things to uh, mark out their spiritual situation. He commends them, you didn't deny the faith even when Antipas was martyred. And then these Scary words, verse 14, but I have a few things against you. They had grown comfortable with a compromise, a, a, a teaching of Balaam. In the Old Testament, Balaam was a prophet. Uh, he was a pagan. He did not love Yahweh, but God made Balaam speak truth to Israel. Balaam was not allowed to curse Israel. He was only allowed to say what God allowed him to say. But when he got past the words... Balaam knew he could tank Israel by introducing immorality. God's not going to let me curse them. God's not going to let me prophesy against them, but will send them some temptations. And lo and behold, it worked. What are the teaching of Balaam's in the church at Pergamum? People who have come into the church and may not be speaking falsehoods, 
but introducing Balaam type teaching, teaching people to eat food sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality in the same way you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. I believe this is probably a reference to Nicholas from Acts 6, one of the early deacon type servants in the church who church history tells us defected from the truth, maintained the name of Christianity and embraced a form of Jesus talk that promoted sexual immorality brought it into the church. The church at Ephesus hated that doctrine. The church at Pergamum got comfortable with it. Jesus says, therefore, repent, or I'm coming to you quickly. I will make war. Then there's the letter to Thyatira. Thyatira was tolerant. In our day, tolerance is a good word. Um, Tolerance really isn't a virtue by itself. We have the command, tolerate one another. That means put up with one another. That's a good thing. But some sort of absolute tolerance, I don't care what goes into my mouth, cyanide or otherwise. Just tolerate everything. That's not wise. The kind of tolerance that does a a flip top head, let anything in without filters, that's not good. That's folly. And here the church at Thyatira tolerated a false teacher, a woman, a prophetess that gets the symbolic name, or maybe it was her real name, but I don't know anybody who named their daughter Jezebel. <laughs> she teaches and leads my slaves astray so that they commit immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. God was patient with this woman teacher in the church, gave her time to repent, even brought about sickness, And then he talks about those who commit adultery with her. Jesus commands them, repent. They are tolerating false teaching. There's another letter, the church at Sardis in chapter 3. Jesus commends them. He says, I know your deeds. You have a name that you're alive. That's as far as the commendation goes. Christian in name only. We might call this church dead as a doornail. This is empty, vacuous, spiritually dead, traditional Christianity. Uh, Riding on the coattails, perhaps, of false professions or, 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 I mean, of uh, of orthodox professions, Uh, maybe even right theology, but no spiritual life. The next letter is the letter to Philadelphia. And this is one, again, with commendation but no confrontation. We might label this letter persevering under persecution. Jesus says in verse 8 of chapter 3, I know your deeds. I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. You have little power and you've kept my word. You have not denied my name. Because you have kept my word, I will keep you out of the tribulation that's coming on the whole world. Jesus promised the church. The final letter is that sobering letter to Laodicea. Laodicea was labeled by Jesus as lukewarm. There's no commendation here. It's all confrontation. They are apathetic, self-satisfied, and repulsive. Uh, lukewarm here is, is not like a middle ground between loving Jesus and hating Jesus. Sometimes we read it that way. You're neither hot for me nor cold for me. I wish you were one or the other. Jesus is not saying, I wish people were dead spiritually cold to me. That'd be great. It's not what he's saying. In Laodicea, their water was supplied from two different sources. From the mineral-rich hot springs from one end of town through clay pipes that the Romans had built. Um, way outside of the city. And then on the other side, from cold, refreshing, uh, healthy springs of water from long distances, again, through these clay pipes. And by the time the water got to Laodicea, it was tepid, warm, and disease-ridden. And it actually made people vomit all the time. Jesus says when he came to Laodicea, he found their spiritual condition like the water in town. And it made him want to vomit. This is another one of those, you don't get to be a church anymore if you live like this. You, you must repent. You can't be apathetic toward Christ. 
You can't be self-satisfied thinking that you're rich and you're clothed and you have everything that you need. Priding yourself on your ability to heal others. You, ISAB was, was local to the economy of Laodicea and, and Jesus uses that metaphor to describe, you think you're hoping the whole world see better and you're blind. Clothing was a commodity in Laodicea and Jesus says to them, you think you're helping the whole world get dressed and you're naked. And it was a wealthy city because of its commerce. And Jesus says, you think you have riches and you are impoverished, destitute, bankrupt. Come to me and get what you need. And in Laodicea, the the, the worst church in the list, you have this gracious invitation in verse 20. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone uh, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. This is an invitation to intimate, personal fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, even from such a miserable spiritual state. Wake up, repent. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapters 2 and 3 are a wonderful template to evaluate how am I doing spiritually? And collectively, how are we doing as a church? Sermon number three comes from chapters four and five. This remarkable throne room scene begins in chapter four. John records, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately, John records, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne standing in heaven, one sitting on the throne. So John hears a voice. He's invited up to distance and future to see what will take place. Can you imagine being in jail, alone, on a rock in the Aegean Sea, separated from those whom you love, whom you cared for, and concerned about the infiltrations of false teachers and the compromise with immorality and the persecuting pressures on those churches that you loved, and you can't get to them. Oh, these little fledgling churches with this great commission, how will this go? In this throne room scene in chapter 4 and 5, John got transported forward and we through him get transported to the future so that we might see how it ends. What is the sermon from this section? Anchor your heart in the sovereign will of heaven. What is the sovereign will of heaven? Well, it's the theme of the book of Revelation. Jesus wins. This is God's will for the universe that his son reign over a new universe and a redeemed people. And the successive stages of judgment, demolition of the earth, regeneration of the earth, a reigning on the earth, and then a new heavens and a new earth are all God's plan to get glory for his son. Glory as the king and redeemer of humanity. And glory as judge. All of those together. So we anchor our heart in the sovereign will of God. We, we come to this scene that we just sang about. The Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. He's worthy of all praise and honor. And we come to this scene in chapter 5 where John the writer weeps greatly Because this search is on for someone to break the seal, open the scroll, and advance God's redemptive plan for the earth. He's going to redeem the earth by judging earth dwellers, kicking out those who have usurped his rightful place, cleaning out the satanically driven rebellion, and refreshing the creation in preparation for the kingdom. Who could advance that program? No creature on the earth. No enemy, no redeemed sinner, and no angel is worthy. Not in heaven, not in anywhere else. And so John weeps. How will this get going? And one of the heavenly beings, one of those elders, came to John and said, Stop weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to break the seal. Open the scroll and advance God's redemptive plan for the earth. 
John turns to look at this lion. Top of the food chain, king of beasts, unstoppable predator, apex. And he sees a lamb standing as if slain. Not a different person, same person. Jesus, the lion, is also the lamb. Still bearing the marks of his crucifixion by which he redeemed all who would believe in him. And we get the sense that the one man-made thing that makes it into the eternal state are the scars of our Savior's crucifixion. And we get the sense that God wants to proclaim for all of eternity in those concentric circles of worship in that future throne room scene and into all of eternity that Jesus is worthy of all worship precisely because he laid down his life and purchased for God a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people to be a kingdom and priest to him. He is worthy of worship because he's creator. He's, chapter 4, he's worthy of worship because he's redeemer, chapter 5. Heaven's not going to forget the gospel of a slain lamb. It's as if heaven never gets past it. We are never to graduate from the good news of a slain lamb. We will join this throng. All of us who are in Christ will be there in person to witness these scenes. John got to see them ahead of time, recorded them for us so that we can be encouraged. Why do we need to see the future? There are dark days ahead for us. We need to fast forward the tape and see how it all turns out. We need this encouragement. There's a fourth sermon It encompasses chapter 6 through 18. 6 through 18. Disattach yourself from a world headed for demolition. I think that's the message. We're in the middle of this section in our Sunday morning expositions. We'll, We'll pick it up again in August. It might feel tedious to you to go from seal number one to seal number two to seal judgment number three to seal judgment number four and five and six. And we finally get to the last of the seven seals. We find that they open up seven more judgments called trumpet judgments and one trumpet blasts after another. And you think, finally, trumpet number seven, we're done with all this. Can we just move on? And the seventh trumpet opens up seven more judgments called bowl or vile judgments. Are you tired of it? God is trying to drive something home for us. It's why it's written. It will actually happen as a historical event in the future. No one will be bored then. But we need to see it in all of its detail. And it takes up all of these chapters 6 through 18 in, in, in really graphic detail of the outpouring of God's wrath and his judgment against the earth dwellers. And it is intended by God to have this profound effect on our hearts. Like like one of those giant pneumatic pounders that, that puts down the soil in preparation for some ground preparation, whether sod or pavers. You've seen these things, it's like a jackhammer, but with a big flat foot. And we're just being pounded by these chapters again and again and again with the same message. I try to find creative ways on Sunday mornings to say it differently. Let go of what God intends to demolish. Friends, where are your loyalties? Where are my loyalties? Why is it so easy to get comfortable in Babylon? Do you know what God is going to do with it? Scott got us there this morning in the book of Zechariah, and he alluded to this very verse in chapter 18. Look at verse 11. 
Zach Can was uh, reading this chapter the other morning. We were talking over the phone, uh, and, and he was struck by this. And we just had this long conversation about this verse. Um, I'm going to quote him just a little bit. Here's what John says, Revelation 18, 11. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her. That is the, the great city Babylon. It is a, a woman as a metaphor of a geopolitical, religious, worldview system governed by Satan, administered by the Antichrist in open rebellion against God, when the tethers have been taken off and mankind gets to do his worst. That's Babylon. When Babylon is destroyed by Jesus in Revelation 18, the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. And just listen to the list. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every article of ivory, an article made of very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble. And it's going to keep going and going. Listen, cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and all of what... Are we done with the list? Not yet. Fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. And then he describes the fruit you long for. All that was luxurious and splendid. Verse 14. The merchants of these things became rich. And then more things are listed later in the chapter. It, what is all of this for? Almost in wearisome grocery lists of the things that make us comfortable, the luxuries of life, the delicacies of life, the, the things we think will satisfy us, the things we think will bring us happiness. We, we want a happy, comfortable life with our conveniences and our luxuries. And notice on the list there are even People traded as cargo and slaves think trafficking in our era. What will bring men pleasure? What will bring people happiness and joy? I need cinnamon and I need my immoralities and I need my comfortable couches and everything in between. Babylon represents a heaven without God. Can I get the stuff that that's going to make my life pleasant, but without the maker. This is the fundamental flaw of the human heart that loves the created thing rather than the creator. This is the greed of idolatry, which seeks things that cannot satisfy and seeks them again and again and again. No matter how many times you try and how many times you come up empty, you go around every next corner looking for the next thing that will make you happy as long as I don't have to answer to God. That is the world, that is Babylon. And notice, it all comes to an end in a moment. Look down at verse 17. In one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. Look at verse 19. They threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. In one hour she has been laid waste. If Babylon were to go away today, would you weep? Would you mourn? Where's your heart, friends? Do you have a white knuckle grip on the conveniences and luxuries and delicacies that the world promises without Christ? Or do you say, take it all and give me Jesus? And does your heart leap at verse 20? Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Where's your heart? Revelation 6 through 18 detail the demolition of the earth as we know it. The day of man, the way man does apart from his creator. Blinded by Satan, ruled by the flesh, the world as its culture and all its animosity to God. I know it's where we live. 
We're in it. We're not of it. But we can get comfortable here. And our loyalties can grow intertwined with its idolatries. Disattach. If the tribulation period, if all those chapters, 6 through 18, are going to pound anything into our hearts, let it pound and pound and pound this message. Do not be like the world. Do not be constrained, conformed into its image. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Come out from her, my people. Do not love what God hates. We are ambassadors here. We are representatives of our king here. We were the system. We've been rescued from it. We now preach the good news to the dead in the system. Hoping that God, the savior of all men, the only savior there is for humanity, will continue to rescue as long as he leaves us here. That gets us to chapters 19 and 20. Sermon number five is prepare yourself for the return of the king. Prepare for his return. Revelation 19 marks the return of Jesus to the earth. His second coming, the second advent, the first time he came as suffering servant. Here he comes as conquering king. Chapter 19 begins with all the hallelujahs, which is a fascinating scene when you think about God's judgment as being a provocation for us of praise. Listen, it's hard for me to grasp the goodness of God's justice sometimes when my friends, my family members, are under his judgment currently and will face his eternal judgment if they do not repent. How could I get excited about the doctrine of hell or the return of Christ, the great white throne, or the millennial kingdom where he rules the nations with a rod of iron. How could I get excited about my Savior and my King and all of his glory if it means the destruction of my friends? Have you ever thought this way? I just want you to know you're supposed to feel that way. Jesus wept over Jerusalem in her unrepentance while he was here on the earth. And Jesus will come back in glory and judge the unrepentant in the earth. Those two things belong in their place. Listen, Jonathan Edwards preached an entire sermon from Revelation 19 on why we will not weep in heaven over those who do not believe, but we do and should weep for them here and preach the gospel to them. Chapter 19 is really helpful for us along those lines. Heaven bursts out into praise that a sea of humanity and rebellion against God gets judged. And it marks Jesus' return to the earth Look at verse 11. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, the one who sat on it, called Faithful and True. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. His robe is dipped in blood. That's the blood of warfare. That's not a reference to the cross. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, that's the saints. They are with him, returning with him to the earth. There are two feasts, two dinners depicted in Revelation 19. You want to be a part of the first one, not the second one. The first one is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those who have believed in Christ in the church age get to rejoice with Him, be unified with Him in heaven before His return to the earth. The second dinner is the feast of the birds on the flesh of all humanity. The kings, the mighty men, the slaves, everybody in between, all those who are decimated by Christ at His return in the battle of Armageddon, their corpses will lie open for the birds to eat them. You've got to repair, prepare for Christ's return. <laughs> if you're an unbeliever and you're listening to me this evening, how do you prepare for the return of Christ? You need to repent and surrender your life to him and believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. Belong to him. Cash in all your chips. Trade the world to get Christ and hurry up. Do it before he comes. When the king comes, Revelation chapter 20 tells us what he will do. He will lock up Satan for a thousand years. He will sit on the throne of his father David, 
and he will reign. It will be world peace. They will beat their swords into plowshares. There will be magnificent prosperity, a lush vegetation on the earth like the whole world made in the Garden of Eden. And there will be justice and rightness exercised. Even in a world that's populated by people who still sin. We'll get to the details of that when we get to Revelation 20. The other aspect of the king's return is that great white throne judgment where he sits on his throne. At the end of the thousand year period, Satan is let out one more time, stages a rebellion, and for some reason people like the underdog and they root for Satan like the sand on the seashore. This is how bad the human heart is. In a perfect environment, a garden of Eden with Jesus visible on the throne. Nobody could say, I don't believe in Jesus. He's there. Nobody could say, the world made me because the world culture belongs to Christ. And nobody could say, the devil made me do it because he was locked up. The only enemy of God left is the human heart and it is wicked enough all by itself to rebel against Christ given the opportunity. And the end of that war is the decimation of everything. I mean, you don't get a big battle scene in Revelation 20 verse 9. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Game over. Doesn't make a a great drawn out movie depiction. Just Jesus wins. Enemies are done. And what happens to the great white throne? Everybody whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life brought before him. They are called the dead and the books are open with all their deeds they've ever done. Every wayward thought, every foul motive, every outward action flowing out of sinful human nature. Judged. None of it's been lost. Big data has kept every single detail. And God will make his righteous assessment. And those not in the Lamb's book of life are thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 15. You get the hard break and then the last sermon, which encompasses chapters 21 and 22. This sermon is just simply long for the eternal state. Read it and want it. How does this sermon end? Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. My friend Doug Searle paraphrased these last verses this way. Apocalypse now. Come quickly. Answer the prayer of your people from all the ages. Your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. Your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close our Bibles in its last page, the final installation, our hearts yearn for your return. We look forward to that day when all things will be made new, when the curse will be done, the first things will have passed away and a new heavens and new earth are brought in by you in which there is no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness, no more pain, no more curse. Death itself will have died and we will live forever in the brilliant, weighty light and glory of your immediate presence. All the anticipatory prayers of the Bible will have been answered. All the vexations salved. All the tensions removed. Faith turned to sight. You will be our God and we will be your people. Oh, how we long for that day. Keep us, O oh Lord, in your grip. Help us to persevere, to endure, to be faithful unto death and to receive the crown of life. By your grace, by your power, and by your great name, we pray these things. All glory be to you. Amen.